Okay, so morning everybody um, and welcome to today's seminar entitled Futurology in the Construction Sector. Um, we felt this to be a particularly pertinent topic as we have come to terms with the new ways of living and working um, because of this unfortunate pandemic. Um, so we're delighted to have um, futurist um, Heather Buis um, as our expert speaker today um, and I'll soon be passing over to Heather to give her own introductions. Um, I'm Will Burkett from Faithful and Gould um, and as co-chair of the club I'm hosting today's seminar. I'll also give you some information on our future club plans before we wrap up. Unfortunately it's been a bit longer than expected since our last breakfast seminar back in January um, and we had to postpone, postpone our um, social valley event at the end of March. Um, so we have, have no bacon sandwiches or pastries laid on today, but hopefully we've all got a, a cup of coffee uh, and ready to get involved. Um, so the committee are working on plans to operate digitally for the foreseeable future, um, and we're keen obviously to hear from our members uh, on the kind of content that will be useful for you going forwards. Uh, so just a few words on today's webinar format. So there are going to be ten, uh, sorry, four 10-minute sections um, to the webinar today, and we'll be breaking for a five-minute Q&A and poll after each of the sections. Um, this could be followed up by a bit of a wrap up from Heather in a slightly longer period of Q&A at the end. So therefore do please um, submit your questions as we go uh, and I'll do my best to make sure we put them all across to Heather. Looking at the attendance list today, um, we have a good mix of uh, clients, consultants, contractors, so we should get a good cross section of opinion come through on the polls. Uh, and Bonnie from White Label is going to keep us updated on those as we progress. Um, I understand you could actually also do a um, put your hand up mechanism by clicking a button. Um, and then you, you can put your your Heather uh, your question directly to Heather as well. Um, so Bonnie, did you want to talk people through perhaps the the operation of the controls? Yeah, morning everyone. So um, as well said, if you'd like to ask a question, you can either do that by typing in the Q and A box, um, and we'll all chair and moderate those questions, or you can raise your hand or just write in the Q and A box that you'd like to ask a question live, and then we can unmute you and um, you can be heard by the whole audience and put your question to Heather um, out loud. So that's the two options for those. And also we thought it would be good to help with networking if people wanted to put a short company overview and say hello to other participants using the chat feature. So questions and um, answers for Heather in the chat, uh, in the Q&A box and networking in the chat sounds like a good way for us to enable you to all meet each other virtually while we're doing the session. Um, so yeah, I think they're the main things. And for the polls, it should just pop up um, as a little box in front of the presentation that Heather's giving. Thanks, Bonnie. So um, over to you, Heather. Thank you very much, Will, and thank you all for the, the invite to join the club. Um, I really dislike the title futurist or futurologist, but it's kind of what I do, so I get saddled with it. Why do I dislike it? Because the future's here. What I talk about is all stuff that's evidence going on in the world today. It's just not necessarily mainstream. And the slightly weird uh, and surreal thing about COVID is that actually suddenly that's become apparent to everybody because the world that we knew and were comfortable with has changed. So my background, um, I've done multiple things. I started life with the Admiralty. I was there while the Falklands War was going on in, in a purely non-active uh, position, I have to say. Then I did publishing. Then I went to work for KPMG, where I've been an auditor, corporate financier, CRM implementer. Um, and about 15 years ago, I got involved in helping them with innovative culture. And out of that, I founded and directed their Future Club left them about five years ago because I kept talking about the gig economy and I decided I ought to find out what it was all about. So I now run my own company and do events like this. So that's, that's my background. So let me say what I'm going to be talking about today. Now, a minute ago, my um, screen was moving quite happily and now, for whatever reason, it's not. There we go. I've got a quote here from Alice in Wonderland. Um, Alice was saying to the Queen that things were impossible and the Queen says, you just haven't had enough practice. Sometimes I believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. And I want to talk really about believing impossible things. And in particular, 
talking about a world that we already had but is going to become more and more a world of and not or and i'll come on to what i mean by that so this for those of you who haven't seen it is the john hopkins university covid dashboard which is probably the best source of data um, visually anyway as an infographic and the first and is the obvious one we're all grappling with covid and we're all trying to keep businesses going at the same time the second and and, and there are multiple ands, so this is just um, one that I'm talking about is at the same time we're worrying about COVID deaths we're also nearing something called the longevity escape velocity longevity has been increasing around the world uh, for a number of years now longevity escape velocity is where technically we are able through science to extend your life by long for more than a year for every year that you live and it's reckoned to be about 2035 when that happens at which point we can all or potentially we can all carry on getting older and this is actually a diagram from um, 2002 and you can see on the graph on the left that in reality, even in the last 10 years, if you were born after 2000, you had a good probability that you were going to live to over 100. Even I, and I'm kind of born somewhere to, more towards the bottom of that ladder than the top, uh, have still got about a third of my life, according to this, still to go. So that makes the whole question of COVID really interesting, particularly as it's raised this debate of which sections of society we value and which we don't and it's why the language that we use i mean i for example detest the word elderly um, because i don't feel at my age that i'm elderly but in much of the language and certainly if you go back in time i would have been considered elderly uh, at my age so there's a whole question here about how we handle change in society both not just in the short term like covid but the long term the second graph here by the way demonstrates that the longevity is not evenly distributed like covid it turns out that the benefits of longevity affect different parts of society this is a problem it was a problem already and it's going to become even more of a problem post covid just want to touch on as a bit of context for what this is doing for how we earn so I'm not unusual in being in the gig economy but in reality if you think about what you will do if you are for example in your early 20s and you know that you're going to live to over a hundred you're highly unlikely to join a company and earn with them for sort of 70 years of your life so what is going on well, we've got four buckets. The middle of this, by the way, is a highly structured day, nine till five, in an office, being dictated as to what you do. And the outer is where you are completely free uh, to do what you want. And we're all very used to employment, whether that's full-time employment, part-time employment. But increasingly, digital work is an enabling new routes, even within the employment sector. We're used to entrepreneurs in the talent leverage site, but increasingly people are making their money. Lifestyle entrepreneur is something I don't think we even have the right phrase for. This is people who aren't in it to make their business worth billions. It's people who are running their own business to make enough money to keep themselves going, to give them the kind of quality of life they're looking for. Esports is fascinating. The top earners in esports are earning about um, half a million dollars a week. And this is proving really attractive to all kinds of people who want to join into esports and participate in what is increasingly a very lucrative area. Asset leverage, 
we're all familiar with eBay, Airbnb, Uber drivers, where you can make money from assets that you own or a member of your family owns that you're able to use and make money from. And finally, investment, where all kinds of new tech has enabled people to invest, not when you only have millions to invest, but actually democratizing this. So you can spend a small amount of money, nutmeg I think is about a five or a month, where you can have uh, algorithms managing what money you have, or you can micro invest, or you can crowdfund in your friend's uh, startup. This has been going on for a while, and increasingly I see particularly the younger and the older generation choosing where to earn money on this spectrum to suit what they want to do in life, to suit their life context. Stop and think about COVID. What COVID has really disrupted in many cases is the structured area in the middle. Okay, many people are proving they can work from home, but it's not necessarily the kind of structured day we had in the office. So what this COVID I think will do on a diagram like this is increase the move towards the outer end of the spectrum where people are looking for less structured days more freedom more opportunity to do what they want i'll come back to how we work later and even in tech we have and so we have smartphones and we have dumb phones and the reason for that is we no longer have a one size fits all we have to all accommodate whether we're a tech giant or somebody else, we have to accommodate an increasing number of options. And this is really what AND is about. AND is about trying to reconcile multiple potentially conflicting objectives. So short-term handling COVID, long-term looking at the impact of longevity, handling people who require more and more sophisticated smartphones at the same time dealing with people who have got a tech backlash or who don't want to get involved in that. So I just want to check that you're all still there and listening. So yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. So first poll, can you think of an and in your own area of work where you're trying to reconcile at least two and potentially more on the face of it mutually incompatible areas and how do you find dealing with it easy hard or impossible can we run the poll please Okay, let's stop it there. I think we're seeing the trend. And by the way, you're not unique. Everybody I know finds dealing with things that on the face of it require completely different ways of responding, um, appear to be mutually incompatible. People always find those harder. Regretfully, I think we're going to have more of that. And I'll come on to uh, more of that in a moment. Thank you. Can we get rid of the poll? So what about technology? I'm going to start by looking at technology and then sustainability and then wider impacts of COVID. So let's look at technology. Another poll for you. Before COVID, did you think we would see the widespread use of new technologies? And what I mean by that is automation, robotics, drones, new materials, new methodologies across the board. Do you think we would see widespread use of new technologies within one to two years, three to five years, or more than five years? Let's run a poll and see. Okay, 
So I think, although we've got most in the three to five years, really the real trend here is that most people were expecting it to be at least three years before we saw a major introduction of, of technology. We'll look in a minute as to how that changes over time. So automation, AI and data. Pre-COVID, the driver for this, as far as I can see, is efficiency, profitability, or workforce perhaps difficulties in getting people. So we've got digital twins helping us understand the built environment across uh, the nation. We've got tech trades, whether that's robotic bricklayers, self-regulating plumbing. And we've got project management, which perhaps is the area where it's most commonly um, been around for quite a long time. Post-COVID, I think it becomes really interesting because there are additional drivers that I think will drive the impact of technology. Social distancing and perhaps inspection where you don't necessarily want to go into areas of the building that you're not sure are safe from a, a virus point of view. So what I think COVID will do around automation, AI and data is give some really new and potentially quite urgent re reasons for increasing the level of technology. New materials, previously very much, I think, around sustainability, effectiveness, insulation type, availability, etc. Again, post COVID, there's a lot of discussion as to whether we're going to see um, shortages in the supply of materials, particularly where those are coming from overseas. So I think we may well see new drivers in terms of security of supply and potentially cost, making us reconsider whether some new materials actually make more sense. Certainly, I think we will see uh, a drive in the short term towards more local supply. So what about new methods? Convenience, speed, cost. And I'm talking here about modular architecture. I'm talking about 3D printing, etc. In reality, when you stop and you think about what happens post-COVID, we may well be looking at the ability to construct more safely. And that may mean controlled environments. So we may see, potentially, our graduation towards more modular architecture, it may increase the reasons for doing that if that can be constructed safely, leaving minimal exposure actually on site. I'm not saying these things are definite. I'm just posing whether this is the what if consequence. So to me, in terms of technology, COVID-19 has been across the board, whatever sector you're looking at, a catalyst for change. People accept, not necessarily willingly, but people accept during something like this that life will not be the same, that change is possible. And therefore we have the opportunity for a radical reappraisal coming out of COVID. We also, because so many people are now working in the virtual world, an increased digital awareness across both current and potential workforces. We have an ever increasing need for agility, adaptability and speed of response. And that at a time when all of those are probably more difficult to achieve. And we have the security of the supply side. So, most of you thought it would be three years plus before COVID. Let's do a new poll and look at whether you think COVID has changed the timing on technology. Can we run a poll, please? Interesting. 
Interesting. So, thank you for that. I think that really interesting. Um, I think opinion, I could make a case for both. Uh, I'm not an expert in your area, but I think generally speaking, um, we are going to see across all sorts of sectors a greater use of technology. Will, I don't know whether there are any questions if I pause on tech in construction at that point. Let's have a little look. So no questions in the Q&A at the moment. Um, please do put your hand up, guys, if you, if you want to answer one direct. But there's a few comments in the chat um, section. So um, Lydia Shilback has, has said, um, health like life expectancy hasn't changed. Uh, everyone will have to uh, develop at least one, or everyone will uh, develop at least one long-term health condition between the ages of 55 and 65. In, in fact, that's interesting. It, it's absolutely correct at the moment, but the um, work that is being done on longevity is actually focused on healthy life expectancy. And so there are, um, that's the reason why we're talking about 2035, because what, what people are aiming for is at the moment you're likely to live to over 100, but you will develop some health conditions. The anti-aging research that's going on, and by the way, anti-aging research is not aimed at making us all live forever. Anti-aging research is aimed at um, addressing the fact that aging globally is the most expensive health condition we've got. And if we could prevent people from getting those long-term health conditions and aging in the sense that we know it, we would actually save trillions across the globe. And there are about five anti-aging streams of research, all of which are looking promising. So yes, you're absolutely tr right at the moment, but the expectation is that that will change. So we have a couple of questions submitted now. So um, from Derek Reese, which sectors does Heather see as the most innovative and adaptive? Hmm. Um, I think that's a really interesting question because if you'd asked me five years ago and three months ago and today I might well have given you different answers so oddly enough one of the most adaptive at the moment I would say is the oil and gas industry because uh, attitudes that changed in 2019 in relation to climate have forced them to become more and more adaptive so I think we're going to see some real areas there. I'm not convinced that the tech sector, um, although it's deemed to be innovative, is enormously innovative. I think what I find fascinating is that I don't think much is happening across sectors anymore. I think increasingly when you talk about innovation, we are talking about the culture of the organisation. So there's a uh, an Asian company called Hire, uh, whose CEO is extremely innovative. It's actually in the business of making white goods, primarily um, consumer electronics in one form or another. And in terms of adapting and innovating within that company, he is massively innovative. I think that's com contrast you know, completely differently with white goods manufacturers in the US, for example. So I think, I think, I know it sounds like I'm not answering the question, but I don't think this notion of just viewing things through a sector lens is actually the most helpful way to think about it. I think the travel and tourism industry is going to have to become very innovative and very adaptive. Um, some will be capable of that, others won't. Okay, thanks. I have some more questions submitted. So um, Simon Philbeam has asked, how do you think the lack of money and expected recession will affect the development of new technologies? I think it depends on the technologies. I think where the technology addresses the lack of money, um, we will see a massive. If you look back over previous recessions, actually they have been the most innovative and where some of the most interesting and exciting and disruptive technologies have come from. 
if you look at the 30s, there was a huge amount of, at that stage, physical science development um, in materials, particularly post Second World War. Um, a huge amount of development around uh, fuels. That was when our, our nuclear fuel industry uh, developed. So I don't think uh, history tells us there's a problem with new technologies. What I will be interested in to see whether, what direction those new technologies take. If you look at a lot of the commentary that's around at the moment, you would expect those new technologies to be focused around addressing climate change, for example, whether they will or whether they will be focused on improving profitability in organizations and industries that are struggling through the recession, I suspect is more likely, unfortunately. Okay, um, thank you. So Paul Eaton has asked, given the thought that local sourcing of construction materials will become more prevalent, what do you think we will see? Um, will, will we see a UK industry shift that refocuses on the manufacturing sector? Ooh. In terms of construction materials, I, I can't answer that. I'm, I'm not a big enough e expert in, in your area. Um, I think you're there looking at, I, I don't think the UK will go back to manufacturing unless it chooses to invest from a technology point of view there. I don't think we have the skills and capabilities for a conventional manufacturing sector. I've, and I'm not, it's not clear to me who is prepared to invest in the kind of automated manufacturing that would make real sense. However, uh, we will need that local supply. And of course, post-Brexit, uh, we don't necessarily have the ability to tap into Europe in the way we did. So I think that's an interesting one and, and one to watch. Uh, and we'll just do one more, I think, before moving on. So um, Dara Jafari um, has asked, post-COVID, I, I imagine that many companies will have adapted to their employees working from home. With that, many people uh, will be doing that in the future. What impact will this have on the economy? Can I come back to that one later? Because I'm going to be talking more about that. So, yeah, Dara, absolutely. please, please do prompt me to come back to that one because I, I can, I can talk more about that later. Okay, I think we're good to move on then, Helen. Okay, Heather. thank you. Thank you. Well. Okay, so what about sustainability? Here's another poll for you. For your business, pre-COVID, was sustainability in construction the primary concern, one of the key determining factors, a decider if all else was equal, or a nice to have? Let's do a poll. So for nobody, sustainability was the primary concern. I think that's interesting. And really, we're, we're pretty evenly spread um, between a key determining factor and a decider if all else was equal. Thanks, guys. We'll come back as before and see what you think post-COVID. So sustainability pre-COVID was, as far as I could tell, something that was handled at the policy level in terms of planning. Yes, lots of good talk, but essentially piecemeal action. There didn't seem to be a concerted approach. Increasingly, what we're seeing post-COVID, for different reasons, I think it's going to become increasingly coarse. So we've got the whole of Amsterdam working off something called uh, donor economics, which balances the uh, societal needs of the city within the constraints of um, essentially the earth and its sustainability. 
really fascinating to see how that is going to work through the built environment, the communities, the changes post-COVID. And at a slightly smaller level, all of London, New York, Paris, Milan are responding to COVID by devoting really substantial sums of money to making their cities more cycle, more walking friendly. And that'll be interesting to see whether that is a knee-jerk reaction or continues into a greater policy. But I think there is a shift, at least in the short term. Repurposing of buildings, built environment. We again have seen a lot of great individual schemes, but it's not been, on the whole, the major approach. Increasingly, we are going to have to look at repurposing. So the idea of large offices, hot desking, where, I mean, certainly KPMG's headquarters, they employ about 8,000 people in London. The office is only designed for about four and a half. That can't happen in a post-COVID environment. The high street, certainly I live in Chichester, and certainly in Chichester, and I don't think we're alone, if I look down the high street before COVID, the vast majority of businesses that were growing were eateries, hairdressers, charity shops. None of these are going to be possible in the immediate aftermath of COVID. So we're going to have to reinvent our high streets. I think we're going to see a major shift to repurposing on a grand scale. Green energy, again, I think we had a lot of great schemes, but limited coordination. Post-COVID, one of the uh, responses that I find really fascinating is that all kinds of people, from the New Zealand minister through to the most recently Mark Carney, actually talking about the need for us to build from COVID, to build from the environmental shift that we've seen happening. We've seen the data on air pollution. We've seen the data on energy uses. We've seen how quickly the world and the environment can change if we are forced to change our behavior. So I think increasingly we will see a concerted lobby uh, effectively looking for both evidence of what can change and hopefully uh, developments that are cost effective in putting that into practice. Regeneration to date, I'm thinking of big regeneration projects, has been formal, institutionally led. I'm thinking of King's Cross, I'm thinking of many of the major sites in London and places in the Northwest. One of the most interesting things that I think has happened in COVID is what's happened at the community level. So if you stop and compare what's happened in terms of the 11, 12,000 community groups that have sprung up across the country to help people who are struggling to deal with the impacts of COVID, and you contrast that with what's happened at the level of the NHS volunteers, 750,000. I don't know whether anybody else is involved, but I've been appalled at how long that's taken and how little it seems able to link into the grassroots level. I don't think people are necessarily going to sit back post-COVID and let big developer institutionally led projects happen. I think we're going to see a lot more community involvement a lot more transparency required and a lot more community influence. So for me, the drivers of change around sustainability post-COVID, clear evidence of how carbon and pollution can be improved by relatively small changes, it's certainly in time, a refocus of people back on lower levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So this at the bottom has the basic needs of security, safety, health, food, water. And at the top, which is kind of where we were pre-COVID, was the, shall I take a sabbatical this year? Where would I like to go on holiday? What is the meaning of life? Um, we've refocused back and I think that will shape how people view sustainability and the impact of climate change. It'll also, I suspect, bring more people into the climate lobby. 
I've talked previously about the catalyst for change. Um, I think what it has demonstrated is the fragility of our society. And I think people will start to fear that climate shocks may be next and that we will need, therefore, to do something urgently about it. And finally, in terms of sustainability, the necessary distancing will change and make big shifts in how we work and behave. So thinking about sustainability, let's go back to the poll. None of you thought sustainability was the primary concern pre-COVID. What about after COVID? Let's have a poll on whether it's more important, less important, or no different. Okay, so very few of you think it's less important. Majority of you think it's going to become more important. When we think about technology and we think about that question on innovation and adaptability after COVID, I think the whole question of sustainability is a really interesting one because in the short term, and I'll touch on this later, I think there are some real issues as to why perhaps it's not as easy as we think to handle it in, in the way we've handled it in the past. Thank you. So what about the broader impact of COVID? How do I see that happening? Well, let's look at the infrastructure level. At the infrastructure level, the traditional response, the traditional economic response to a recession has been investment in infrastructure. And we've seen that across the globe and we've seen a lot talked about it already. But we managed to create Nightingale Hospital within a very few weeks. And there's been a lot of criticism in other areas about how fast we have or haven't moved. So the question is, have we changed our view on the need or the speed for infrastructure? What is it we are going to want our infrastructure to do? And how fast do we expect it to happen? And let's go back to sustainability. Are there new criteria for the success of infrastructure? Is it no longer good enough just to build more infrastructure? Do we actually have to have it as a purpose? And is that purpose directed at sustainability or climate change? The high street. The high street was already in crisis before COVID. We already had an absolutely fascinating trend to me for people renting. Renting in all kinds of things, renting clothes, renting furniture. And the reasons why people were renting were really interesting. In many cases, one of the reasons for renting was expense. I've been fascinated to see that um, earlier this year in Tel Aviv and New York, a company called Tulu has created rental hubs associated with large blocks of flats, apartments, condominiums, where essentially you are able to rent the furniture, the tools, anything you might want, which you don't want to buy because you want it on a temporary basis. All sorts of trends were already there, which had the possibility of changing the high street. Post COVID, we're going to have real changes to how we shop, at least people believe we will. And it's become very clear that although we'd quite like to do more online shopping, certainly on a food level, Tesco, Sainsbury's and the rest have pointed out that they just will not have the capability to deliver more than 10 to 15 percent of food shopping. All of this is really leading to an opportunity to redesign our urban centres. This coupled with the high street problem, coupled with the desire to get people cycling and walking and away from cars and public transport is a real opportunity to redesign um, our urban environment. Whether we will take it, I don't know. So what about the world of work? We're on Zoom today. And um, if anybody's interested, this is what's happened to Zoom's share price as a result. 
unsurprisingly, and if you look at Netflix and Amazon, they're both up there as well. So where do we go from here? Well, there's lots of work going on about what the post-coronavirus office may look like. We've got Landsec talking about um, the fact that only 10% of office space is currently in use. So we will probably go from, uh, if you take that route, we will go from 10% being in use to actually all of it being used and are still needing to work from home because of the space requirements. It's not clear what kind of roles will be more or less attractive. Working outside at the moment uh, seems to be hugely popular. Whether or not it will be, we just don't know. And there's another way that this might go. We could, at least for those areas of work where we can work from home, we could transfer ourselves to a completely virtual environment. For those of you who are familiar with or remember Second Life, I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about the next generation of it, where in reality, instead of commuting to work, we log on as our avatar and take our virtual walk to our virtual office, picking up our virtual coffee and chatting in the virtual coffee shop along the way. Is it likely across the board? No. Will we see investment in technology around AR, VR, tactile interfaces that will make it more and more appealing? Absolutely we will. We are already seeing the rise of the virtual travel industry where you can take a trip to Nepal or Iceland virtually and look around in exactly the same way that you would there. So I think there's real opportunity for the world of work to change dramatically. Not least because of what we're thinking as individuals. The picture at the moment is massively mixed around how individuals are responding to this. There are people who, for whom the lack of work, the lack of connectivity, the lack of friends, colleagues at work, and the sheer stress of being at home is proving a nightmare. However, there's also quite a large group of people who are enjoying the cleaner air, enjoying better food, enjoying being at home with their family, and they don't want to return to normal. It's really fascinating to see those two extremes playing out. At the same time, it's very obvious that we're about to enter into a recession, which is likely to change public perception and public response significantly. Not least because we don't actually know what COVID is going to do to the housing market. I see sales are now back on. It will be, to me, absolutely fascinating where people choose to live in the UK after this, whether price values change away from the southeast, perhaps improving uh, values in the southwest or more isolated areas, what that does for resources, what it does for support networks, and what it does for infrastructure. But I think the picture as us as individuals is really confused. I think all of this leads to some really big design issues. So let's just take safety and security. Already in America, there were condominiums being designed with extra large concierge areas to take delivery of all of the online shopping that's going on. If we continue to buy online, what implications is that going to have for space, how we collect stuff? Entrance and mobility is already proving a nightmare for many offices. Are we going to see the need for escalators rather than lifts to move people around en masse? The rental labs, the rental hubs I already talked about, We've already got minor issues. I call them minor, but potentially they're not. When you look at what's happening in manufacturing, the places that are already opening, one of the things they're all talking about is leaving as many doors as possible open to avoid people needing to touch and raise the risk of infection. How does that sit with fire safety or health and safety generally? So there's a massive of small and large design issues around safety, security, moving people around. 
we've got this sustainability issue and on the face of it it looks really encouraging it looks like we're going to get more focused on sustainability but what happens to some of the design things that were going on like enclosed buildings where actually um the the uh, energy efficiency of the building was dictated by its insulation its closed nature how is that going to sit with a worry about infection and viral um, contamination agility and adaptability this for me is the big one we are familiar with multi-use buildings but I'm not sure we're that familiar with the use of buildings that is capable of changing over time, repurposing on a really agile basis. And how are we going to predict that? So somebody um, I was talking to from the hotel industry was saying that he can see um, an increasing need for buildings which are part office, part sleeping accommodation, so people don't have to travel so frequently, and part retail rental all sorts of things so multi-purpose but where the balance of those activity can be changed quite quickly and in all of this there's this question of how do we predict how do we gain insight into some of these areas well enough in advance to do the design and in all of this, there are some really big questions. So how long will it take us to get fully out of lockdown? Well, that little thing from the BBC archive is interesting. Five years after the uh, finish of World War II, restaurant restrictions were lifted. The answer to how long is, I don't know. But the World Health Organization said on one level, we may never we may just have to live with the virus and certainly i think the message on how long will it take us to get out i think is one that can only be answered by it depends it depends what it is that you're talking about restaurants places like that may be years other areas may get back within three months the health service may actually change dramatically how we access health may change dramatically so I think the answer is years, but within that, there will be a very, very varied response, not least because geographically across the globe, I think countries will get out of this at different stages. Will it accelerate automation? This is a big, big question. The answer, I think, is yes in some areas, but that of itself may not necessarily be a plus. So already I'm involved in quite a lot of debate as to whether COVID and working from home is going to improve gender discrimination in the workplace. Are we going to see women, if everybody's working from home, is that going to make it life easier for women? And the answer is, if automation accelerates, almost certainly not, because automation accelerating is going to affect a lot of the jobs for which women do. Also, we're going to see the acceleration of jobs, for example, in health, many of which are not capable of being automated. How many of us sitting in intensive care or lying in intensive care with COVID would have wanted a robot looking after us? Not many, I suspect. So the answer is yes, but not across the board. Will it change our behavior? Well, I think what's been fascinating, particularly about this last week, is just how rapidly people have returned to public transport, even though they've been asked not to. So the answer is, will it change our behavior? The answer is perhaps. But I suspect we're going to need quite a bit of nudging and encouragement and facilitation if we want to change our behavior on a permanent basis. And what's next? I think this is a really interesting question. I'm not trying to be negative here, but if you think back, if you are a, a member of the Gen Z generation, particularly the part of that generation which sort of overlaps with Gen Y, so you're 18 to 24 at the moment, in your early teens from 10 onwards, you were struggling with the consequences. You saw your family struggling with the consequences of the financial crisis. 10 years on, 
we've now got COVID. It's really hard to see that generation as thinking of anything, this anything other than a series of really quite nasty shocks. And it's entirely possible that climate may give us some more, even though we're basking in, uh, I think, the warmest and sunniest spring we've had in a very long time. So I think we shouldn't assume that the answers to those three above are the end of the story. I think we should expect further shocks on the climate front, an increased need for uh, electricity and energy to deal with that, whether it's heating or air conditioning, and actually at the same time, an increased interest in sustainability, which will require us to deal with that much more effectively. So looking forward, if you think about all of those post-COVID things, do you think the construction industry has more opportunities, less opportunities, just different opportunities, or just the same? Let's do a poll. Okay, interesting. We'll have a discussion a bit later as to what those different opportunities are. I'll be fascinated to hear. Thanks, guys. Now, oh, there we go. So, Will, should we take some questions? Yes, there? let's break for a few questions. I think. Yeah, thanks, Heather. So, um, Jane Hughes has asked. Uh, what if we get a vaccine that works? Uh, surely none of th these post-COVID changes aren't going to happen because they won't be necessary and they're all expensive. Um, I think there's two kinds of changes. I think there are changes that are due specifically to the distancing, distancing requires of COVID. I think there are other changes which will happen because people have become aware of the fragility of the society we live in. So some of them, if we did get a vaccine, wouldn't be necessary. I agree. Some of them are expensive. Um, but I think you will still see some of them because I still think there will be an ongoing need for people to feel more confident more comfortable that our society will not be hammered in this way in the future i suppose a question for me to follow that heather is are we, are we likely to see sort of very fast paced and, and heavy regulation that tackles both the risk of this pandemic and future pandemics and, and potentially sustainability at the same time um, I'm not sure it's going to be that easy to regulate. I think um, looking at what's happening to the police force at the moment where they can only enforce laws and so much of what we're talking about is recommendation. I think the question of what's going to happen to regulation over the next two, three, four years is really interesting. I think increasingly regulation is going to have to become enabling and facilitating as much as it is prescriptive. Uh, because I think we need to rebuild trust, but I think people's behaviour is going to have to change in that. And so we're going to have to nudge people towards that. I think we will see more regulation. I'm not sure it's the kind of regulation we've, we've seen in the past. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Tony Russell, uh, Stride Trail Ground, has uh, asked, could you see, foresee a situation where we have a global cybersecurity pandemic on a similar scale uh, and impact of COVID and should we be planning for this now? Well, uh, my own view is that we are in an increasingly fragile world and I don't know whether the next crisis will be climatic, cyber, political. I you know, can't believe that one or other of the world leaders that we have uh, isn't sitting there seeing this as an opportunity, um, which may or may not be positive for the rest of us. Um, so I don't know whether it's political, climatic, cyber is just as likely. Um, but I think we should be planning for more 
shocks, more crises. And we should be assuming that we have a fragile society. Um, and I think it is expensive, but I think it's even more expensive to do what we've done in COVID and respond after the event. Uh, so another question from Jane Hughes. Um, how do we reconcile the progress, a proposed huge increase in online shopping and the huge number of deliveries in vans and cars with the push to cycling and pedestrianisation? Uh, sorry, uh, uh, let me see if I've understood the question. Are we talking about how do we reconcile uh, large numbers of people cycling and walking in an area that's going to require more and more van and traffic? Van and car traffic? Yes, yeah. Okay. Um, I think this is a really interesting one. And I, I think the move to pedestrian is very much uh, pedestrianisation and cycling. It's, it's an obvious but quite a knee-jerk reaction. Um, I don't know that it will last. I rather hope it does, but I don't think it will be limited to cycling and pedestrianism. I hope it will lead to a greater debate on electric scooters, electric bikes, you know, how can we move around generally? In terms of deliveries, um, if you look back over the logistics industry, it's been fascinating. We started with an assumption when uh, shopping online started that everybody would want it delivered. And we then went back to click and collect. And I think what will happen on online shopping is that as people go back to normal lives, it will become a matter of delivering where it is convenient. That may or may not be at home. So we may have the vans and cars more spread out at the moment. They're, they're all very much at home. I think it's a really interesting question. I think the whole integration of transport and infrastructure and how that works in the future, we have the opportunity to really radically look at that. Um, you'll pay more, I suspect, for delivery at busy times. There will be a temptation to try and get stuff delivered at overnight at least to to areas click and collect will be um become more common and i think where you collect from will be uh, will have more and more places that you will collect from and it may be that the high street becomes much more of a community center where we're meeting for coffee we're meeting to collect stuff i think it's a really interesting question i'm not sure i have the full answer Thanks, Heather. Um, Bonnie, I saw that somebody raised a hand. Are we able to um, allow them to ask a question direct? Yeah. Who was it that raised a hand? And I will find you and unmute you. Was it Bradley? Okay, Bradley from Kia. I'm allowing you to talk. You need to unmute your microphone your end as well. If you're not able to. Hello, I'm sorry, I'm struggling to hear you. Sorry, I was trying. Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Hello, how are you doing? Um, Hi, it Bradley. was actually an unintentional raised hand, but I do have a question anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question was do you, well, for anyone really, uh, do you foresee that um, sort of post COVID, the requirements um, going forward for um, companies will be greater so sort of questions within tenders pqqs and those things do you see that being an ongoing thing that requirements for people to demonstrate their preparedness for covid will be something that we anticipate sorry bradley could you repeat that uh, it was just it was just a broad question really so do you see that post covid for various companies going forward do you see that that's going to be something that we're asked to demonstrate our preparedness for so for various construction projects going forward? COVID, in the short term, I'm sure it will be um, what people will want. I would hope over time what they're more interested in is the resilience to a broader range of potential disruption in whatever form that takes. So that's why, um, you know, things like modular building where you can control 
uh, the majority of the bill somewhere else and minimize the amount of sight on time might be I'm not saying it will be but it's the sort of thing that you might see as a response to any kind of shock not just COVID but there must be others who have views on that uh, thanks for that one Bradley um, so, so some more questions written questions here so um, from Alison Nicol head of constructing excellence uh, do you think that much of the journey towards increased digitalization and manufacturing based construction are all part of making the construction industry more resilient to future shocks? Mm -hmm. um, of course, digitization makes us all more resilient. The answer, of course, is it, it doesn't. The answer is it will if that is set out as one of the objectives. But digitization and manufacturing based construction will not necessarily make it more resilient if it isn't part of a broader plan. Um, there's a temptation to assume that technology will always be progressive and helpful. It, it's not always. So I think, I think this requires a sort of holistic view. And this is why I've called this an and not or talk because the holistic view says the plans for the future, whether those are on increased digitalization or anything else, need to combine efficiency and hence increased profitability in the short term uh, through the recession with increased resilience looking forward. And it's the right balance between those and making sure both are incorporated in, in whatever plans. Uh, just maybe one more question before we move on. So Sarah Evans has asked, uh, we have spoken at past events as to how historically the construction industry has been slow or resistant to change. Does Heather see a need for greater collaboration amongst supply chains and specialisms to move forward with the challenges of COVID-19? Uh, I see a need for it. Whether that means it will happen, I, I don't know. Um, I come back to my point earlier about holistic thinking. We've got an opportunity and they don't come around very often. We've got an opportunity post COVID to do some radical thinking or to go back to normal business as normal. The temptation is quite often for people to go back to business as usual. In reality, uh, that to my mind is missing the big opportunity to collaborate and say, what kind of future do we want? How do we make the sustainable answers more efficient, more effective, more cost effective? How do we use digitization, not as an, an automation, not as an end in itself, but as a means to creating the industry and the society that we want? Okay, I think um, there's, a f there's a few more questions, but we'll perhaps loop back to those, Heather. So, um, yeah, I need to come back to Dara's one, but we'll carry yeah. on and then come back to those. Okay, thank you. So, I just wanted to finish by going back to my and not all. So, these are some of the big ands that I think are really fundamental to where we go. And when I call them ands, what I mean is that, that these look like options and they're not options. And the, the trick is to decide what's the balance between the two. So how do you plan in an industry that is primarily and frequently looking at long-term investment? How do you build into that agility and adaptation capability? How do you deal with regeneration, which I think is where we're going on sustainability. So regeneration being the ability not just to sustain at zero impact, but to actually improve the environment, to put back, to regenerate. How do we build both that and profitability? How do we, as I mentioned a minute ago, create efficiency, profitability, and at the same time, the resilience that we need? How do we do enough of business as usual to give people confidence and comfort that life is going back to something that they feel comfortable with, whilst at the same time having enough radical innovation to leverage this as an opportunity to really change? How do we build distance and proximity? because people will be concerned about distance for 
at least sometime post COVID. How long? Depends on how long how long it is before we get a vaccine, how much is prevalent in society, whether we still need intensive care for those who are most seriously affected by all sorts of things. And how do we build in security, safety and fun? If you go back to the 20th century, both both world wars were followed by a frivolous period. And people are going to want a level of frivolity as a respite from all of this. At the same time, many of the ways we've had frivolity in the past, restaurants, bars and that, will be really difficult. So combining those two is going to be really interesting. Just in case uh, you didn't think you've got enough challenges uh, on what I've talked about, there's a group here looking for collecting designs for a Martian city and where we go from here. And I just wanted to leave you with one of my favourite cartoons of the moment. It's hard to survive in the jungle when you were brought up in the zoo. So, Will, open to all questions. Don't know where we want to go from here, okay. but that was yeah. all I was going to say. Thank you very much, Heather. Some fascinating, uh, thought-provoking things there. So, do we want to loop back to Dara's um, question now? Yes. So, uh, post COVID, I imagine that many companies uh, will have adapted to their employees from working home, working from home. Uh, with that, many people doing, with many people doing that in the future, what impact on the economy do you think this will have? And and he's also sort of clarified by saying thinking about restaurants, bars, coffee shops in particular. Yes. As well. Yes. Um, I think. I don't think um, working from home is incompatible with restaurant bars coffee shops etc um, I just think where they are potentially is different um, I think most people who opt to work from home in the future will find they have the same need for respite from their desk as they do in the office in fact potentially more because they perhaps don't have the same level of people around them for chit chat uh, whatever so I think I don't think it will change that in the medium term. I can see, obviously, in the short term, there's a big issue around restaurants, bars, coffee shops. Although uh, I think it's quite hopeful that many of them are now opening more for takeaways and things, which I think is the start point for this. But I think the working from home, however appealing, uh, having worked from home myself i know a very few people for whom it is a hundred percent brilliant answer every day of the week so i think we will shift to some kind of mixed working okay thanks um another question from derek just one for me to answer really um this the slides i'm recording is going to be made available on on the website um so you can pick that up again later derek um so from lydia um do you envisage uh, more mobility of workers across sectors in the future? I'm thinking if construction is increasingly carried out with robots, what is likely to happen to those who have worked in traditional sites, such as trades and labour? Is this likely to in increase inequality in the short term? I have to say, uh, pre-COVID, inequality, um, both in the UK and elsewhere, has been, to my mind, the issue of greatest concern. I don't see automation doing anything in the short to medium term other than changing, than increasing inequality. Um, and I don't think COVID has changed that view. So I think inequality is one of the biggest issues that we face as a country. And how we deal with it and how we help people reskill and what we propose as alternatives to the traditional areas, um, and, and many of those are in construction, I, th I think remains a huge question. Uh, and we have one final question here from Drew Cracknell. So um, pre-COVID force majeure clauses in construction contracts commonly lack definition, and the contractors often accepted the financial risk of pandemic events. Do you think that in a post-COVID world, the balance of, for risk items like this will shift towards the client? Hmm. Um, 
I'm not going to answer that specifically. I, I don't necessarily feel confident to answer it. What I do know is that everybody is going to be, from insurance companies onwards, is going to be looking at tightening up their uh, clauses. The problem with that is that it always creates one of two issues. Either it leaves loopholes and everybody starts looking for loopholes. And so everybody gets concerned with minutiae and trying to, so contracts, et cetera, get longer and longer as people try and cover all eventualities. Or we lose sight of common sense, which says, um, you know, act of God, force majeure is something that affects everybody. And we have to have a collaborative view to it. I, I wish I could say that would happen. I'm not sure it will. Um, I think you're right. I think where it will end up, I, d I don't know. I think that's something very much people in the industry will debate. Um, but I, I do think that um, it would be much more helpful to have a what's the common sense answer to this rather than trying to legalise it. Because we just don't know what kind of shocks will happen. We don't know... The consequences of those shocks, the consequences of uh, a cyber, a global cyber shock would be very different in that sense to a, a global, well, perhaps they wouldn't if, if construction was massively digitized, but they might be, to, to a pandemic and could be very different again from a, a climatic one. So a really tricky one, I think. The answer sort of seems obvious to be yes, but I'm not sure it's the right answer. I'm sure some of the uh, the solicitors and, and uh, legal guys on on the call will have their the thoughts on that. In the I chat. was going to say you need a, lo a lawyer to answer it. They'll give you a very <laughs> different answer from me. I tend to go rather more for the pragmatic one, which is not helpful in terms of contracts. I think something just interesting to, to tell everybody is that we're looking to have some kind of um, thought leadership roundtable events um, in in the future, pick, picking on a few sort of subject topics. Um, and you know that could be one that we take forward. So if, if there is anything like that you'd like us to pick up in, in one of those thought leadership roundtables, then then please do um, note it in the chat. Um, so another one from Ian Toms: Will HS2 proceed? What about the massive hospital building program? I think HS2 got the go ahead recently, didn't it? Yes. Um... I think there's a slightly different answer to that, which is um, what's more interesting is, I don't know whether it will proceed, by the way, uh, the, the ways and whims of government are mysterious and not always obvious to people outside. Um, I think what's more interesting is will COVID lead to a change in where people choose to live and work and will HS2 therefore have a greater or lesser reason for being? Which I think COVID, you know, might change where people want to live. You look at the sheer numbers in London, you look at the, the numbers of people trying to move around London and the likelihood of contamination and infection and things. And I don't know whether it, it will actually change where people want to live. A massive hospital building programme, I'm not sure that, I think that probably is in the too expensive. Um, why, would, why would we want that on a permanent basis? What I would ha rather hope is that it will change a view of how people um, initially interact with health. So I hope that we would see more mobile health health applications more um, diagnosis through video and things which has the potential for changing the whole um, infrastructure around health hospitals um, then become centers for therapy um, for uh, intensive care etc and potentially we see uh, lower numbers of gp surgeries or, or perhaps uh, more we either see more local ones or we see more uh, larger GP centres because you deal with most of your day-to-day -day stuff through a mobile app. But I'm not sure I see a need for massive hospital building. 
Okay, thanks, Alan. Some interesting comments on the chat. Um, so, David Savage, uh, Charles Russell Speechleys, has, has responded to um, to Drew's comment. Um, so, a couple of things. I think we can be confident that FM clauses will be focused on and heavily negotiated going forward. Indeed, we are already seeing this. Uh, and as a follow-up, it, it, it is uh, unamended JCT, which doesn't define force majeure. Well-advised clients are amending that provision and have done for, for many years. Um, so something to think about there, I suppose, for, for people. Um, so just on other questions. So I think we've picked up all the in the Q&A there. And I'm just looking again at the chat for any questions. Um, so there's another comment here from David Savage, um, uh, Charles Russell Speechley. So the problem with big structural change in the UK construction sector is the very material capex investment required. Think robotic production of prefabricated housing in large factories. And a massive recession is unlikely to help with traditional contractors being in a position to raise investment finance for that change. Um, so I think highlighting the, the extreme expense um, uh, of some of this change when we are um, coming into a recession. I, I think... I think that I mean that's not limited to construction. That that the consequences are are expensive. I think to some extent at the moment um, we're comparing that expense with a pre-COVID world where we could just carry on the way we were. And I don't know what what will change, um, but I suspect it just will not be possible to work always in the way we worked previously. So A, there may be a question of having to change. I'm not suggesting expensive solutions like modular architecture are necessarily always the answer, but I suspect some change may be forced on us. And um, at the same time, one hopes that technology and investment would bring the cost of some of those down. So I think you might find um, between a rock and a hard place, we go some areas that previously we haven't seen as possible. So we have a couple more questions now, um, very characteristic and, and uh, upbeat one from Derek as usual. So um, if there's one uh, personal trait characteristic we could all adopt in Brace to best position ourselves, our organisations and our communities, what would it be? My answer to that has been the same for the last five years. Tolerance of ambiguity, which is, not, which is easy to say and, and not easy to, to do, but the ability to being open to different possible futures rather than constantly looking for certainty and guarantees um, at the personal level, to my mind, is, is, is really something that's worth cultivating. Um, we have another question from Dara. Um, so th this is yeah, this is one related to the tourism tourism industry. Um, yeah. So I, I don't have the predictions on that figure. Um, so he's expecting he's asking effectively if um, if there's likely to be a large increase in the UK tourist industry. Yes, uh, I mean I think. <laughs> As with all of these things, it's very easy to say, yes, of course. And the answer is yes, of course. But if you actually look at what people are doing now, they're looking at camping and there's a sort of return to simple pleasures. Now, whether that will continue, I don't know. Um, but again, you know, it's easy to say, yes, there'll be more people holidaying in the UK than going abroad whilst travel is upset. But does that necessarily mean an increase in uh, for the construction sector? Will the tourism that we're talking about in the UK be of the kind that we used to do elsewhere? I don't know. And neither, by the way, does the tourism industry. <laughs> um, so just while people um, give time to people to think of any last questions, I've just seen another one pop through for me and Tom. It's just, just one from me, Heather, in terms of... Um, if people have an interest in this, in, in futurology... Um, is there any good kind of reading materials and, and um, things you can recommend for them uh, to kind well, of one, look The at? easy way I would suggest is the World Economic Forum, uh, which is what lies behind Davos every year, has a brilliant website 
with material on anything and everything that you can think of. They do big projects, but they also collect masses of material. And you can log on there, um, register with the site, and then you can put in you know, the areas that you're interested in. And it's, it's one of the best central sources I can think, and it will take you out in all kinds of other directions if you wish to go deeper. Fantastic, thank you. Well, we do have one other raised hand in the audience, which may or may not have been an accident, but um, Ben Hoskins has got his hand up, so I didn't know if we wanted to try and take that question live as yes, well. Yes, please. Um, so Ben, Hello, I'm can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, uh, it's uh, Ben Hoskins from Diamond Build. I just wanted to bring up um, an opportunity, going back to sustainability around COVID-19. It's only something I've seen on LinkedIn, but um, the change down in Portsmouth and the coastal line there, where no ships have been going back and forth. Yep. We've seen that turn tropical, which is uh, just remarkable, to be honest. But I, when you put that pole up, I just said that no change will come of it kind of thing. Because when COVID-19 goes and passes, and it will pass, ships will return back to normal, and that will, that will eventually just start going back to uh, black again, I suppose. <laughs> I, I think... I think it's not not just ships and things. I think there is an enormous debate as to whether all of this is a temporary behavioural change and we all try and get back to normal or whether we seize the opportunity. And that, for me, is one of the biggest ands we've got. We have now got evidence that over a short time, huge changes can happen in the environment um, just by us stopping doing various things. And that evidence is persuading some people who haven't previously been persuaded that, that we should try and do more. On the other hand, recession, economic pressure, uh, the desire to get back to usual may well override those instincts we have at the moment. Mm. Quite agree. Thanks for that question. Um, so just one final one on the uh, Q&A. So uh, all very thought provoking. Thanks. This is from Ian Toms. Um, less enclosed shopping centres and more open malls, i.e. high streets, a possibility or less retail in, in its entirety. Uh, less offices possible, but huge impact on pension funds and local authority income. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think. All of these are possibilities. We could end up with less retail in entirety. In reality, as I say, I may, Chichester may be completely atypical, but to my mind, we've had a lot less retail, um, a lot less diverse retail since the financial crisis anyway. So you could see uh, uh, this as continuing that trend. What, I'm, what I haven't seen is, and this is partly what I mean when I say COVID-19 is a possibility, um, an opportunity, a catalyst for change. We're asking people to substitute walking and cycling for public transport. And that will have attached to it in most urban centres a big cost. I haven't seen any debate as to whether we should be charging people to walk and cycle. I'm not saying we should. I'm just saying we have the opportunity to consider if we're asking people to make a substitution from something they would have paid for to something that will have a cost, whether it should be considered. So I think as well as thinking about how do we return to those areas that brought in income, and I, I quite agree on pension funds and local authorities, um, as well as thinking about how do we return to those, I think it's a really great time to think innovatively about new sources of income. If we're monitoring stuff, what data is being collected? How can we collect data on a holistic basis? And what use can other people make of that? If local authorities collect the data, what use can other people make of that? How can that how can they provide a platform from which they can earn uh, income because other people are making use of it for example i just think i haven't seen enough thinking on how things could change subsequently yeah i mean i think an observation for, obviously i work for a lot of local authority clients is that they have had a conservative push on income 
um, generation, uh, particularly because of the austerity you know, that has, uh, has held over the last few years. They've had to have that change in shift. Um, so maybe that will accelerate that further. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another one from uh, Drew Cracknell. So in recent years, we've started to see more requests refocus away from the London bubble local communities however London and other cities have still been looking towards vertical mass evidently this is one of the worst hit areas do you think this will encourage urban sprawl and um, that could have a hugely negative impact on the environment I suppose that ties in quite closely with the, the aging population statistics as well Heather that you were yes yes and speaking as somebody who sits in an area immediately outside the national park um, which has clearly pushed a huge amount of development onto the coastal plain it is um you know you can see it do i think that people will move just outside london is essentially um i don't know i i think i'm fascinated to see i will be watching how sales and in particular warehouse sales are really in, in a really interesting way over the next six months because i think I've seen two completely different views of what it is to be in lockdown. One saying it's great to be well away from centres of population. Uh, we feel much safer. We don't have a problem with online shopping, etc. We can get anything. And another saying, I'm so pleased we live in a city where there is still somewhere a cafe down the road to get a coffee where it's very easy to help our neighbours as much more of a community feel and, and both views are being expressed um so i'm not sure it's always the answer to that is always it's always a rational response at the moment it's very much an emotional one based i think on how secure and safe people feel i think uh the house sales will tell us whether that uh, is sustained um or, or whether in reality once uh, an immediate fear of infection passes whether uh, people revert I, I must admit the the swift move back into public transport once um, work was being opened up suggests that it's relatively temporary uh, so we've only got a couple minutes left so just one final question Heather um, with capital costs being king and a pinch of finances at present even if there is a desire to change to a more sustainable future, will this happen? The current situation shows that managing predicting social behaviour is difficult. This must be led by legislative change. Do you agree? Um, I would agree that legislative change is a key element to it. I'm not sure that... I think there's been... Uh, and I, one of the consequences of COVID, again, I'll be watching with interest, is people's view to government and democracy generally. Uh, legislative change will be needed. Whether it will be enough and whether it is actually the leading question, I don't know. Um, I think the problem with legislative change is that um, people don't necessarily it doesn't necessarily meet what people believe is needed and uh, I don't think therefore it's necessarily enough to change people's behaviour. I think there would need to be other things in there as well. Okay thanks Heather. Um, I think we're going to be cut off very shortly. Could you just flick onto the next slide just so I give a quick update on future events? Yes of course. Let Thank me just get rid much. of all my boxes. Um, so as a club, obviously, we're looking to do more webinars going forward uh, for the foreseeable future. And, and I mentioned again uh, earlier about the, um, the thought leadership roundtables that we're looking to hold. So please do email me. Um, my details are on the website of any topics you'd like to, us to cover. We've also got a newsletter um, coming out monthly going forward as well. Um, and we're also looking for people to share content for that newsletter. So again, please um, do send everything over to me. But big thank you to you, Heather. Um, much appreciated that's been fascinating um for everybody and and thanks to everybody for your participation as well um it's great questions and involvement in the chat as well um and and lots of thanks coming to through to you on the chat there heather as well um so time's up so we're gonna have to leave it there much appreciated everybody and um hopefully see you soon thanks guys have a good yeah. day bye